You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme... Displaced because of climate change, Sky News analysis reveals the unequal impact of extreme weather events around the world. Less meat, more veg, how changing what we eat could help save the planet. And the designer using a very unusual material to make fashion more sustainable. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. And we start today with the extreme weather that's caused severe flooding in Germany. At least 44 people have died and more than 70 are missing after torrential rain hit parts of Western Europe. Although linking any single event to global warming is complicated, climate change does increase the frequency of extreme weather events. And Sky News analysis has found that the impact of these disasters on people isn't shared equally. In 2020, weather-related events led to more than 30 million displacements around the world, where people are forced from their homes, at least temporarily. The vast majority of these displacements were caused by severe storms and floods, and nearly two-thirds of disasters last year were in China, Bangladesh, India, the Philippines and the United States. Now, in the US, the richest country in the world, 500 Americans per 100,000 were forced from their homes, at least temporarily, due to storm surges and wildfires. It shows even wealthy countries face the threat of displacement and migration due to climate change. But Sky News analysis has found people from poorer countries are five times more likely to be displaced because poorer countries are less able to recover from disasters. Governments lack the resources needed to help prevent these events becoming crises and to cope with the aftermath. Now, Somalia is one of the nations most vulnerable to climate change. Drought in 2017 caused nearly 900,000 displacements and floods caused by extreme rainfall and a cyclone last year forced a further million people from their homes. Now, overall last year, an average of almost 20,000 displacements took place every time a severe weather event occurred in low-income countries, compared with 4,000 displacements in the wealthier nations. So, those are the numbers, but what does that look like for those affected? Here's our diplomatic editor, Dominic Waghorn. Colourful, but squalid, where thousands of Somalis are now forced to live. Displace sounds such a neutral term. It means being forced to give up your home, flee for your lives and end up somewhere like this. Like Hawa Osman Abdi, whose home was washed away by floods, who's lost her husband and is now left alone with nine children. The same story in India with a cyclone bringing floods in Bengal, forcing many others to flee. There are climate-driven weather disasters in richer countries, of course. Five hurricanes in one year in this part of Louisiana. And devastating wildfires wreaking havoc up and down the west of North America. You'd expect the impact to be easier on the first world. More resources, better infrastructure. But the new figures reveal the extent of that gulf. Climate change uprooting five times as many people in poorer nations than rich even though developed nations can suffer even more devastating weather. What is universal is the sense that something is shifting and in the wrong direction. There's something going on, that's for sure, man, because it's one thing after another. One thing after another, and for millions and millions, only getting worse. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. And you can read more about that investigation by the Sky News data and forensics team on our website, skynews.com slash climate.
Let's take a look now at some of the day's other climate news. And the Marine Conservation Society is urging people to take part in this year's Great British Beach Clean. Volunteers will collect rubbish from coastal areas across the UK during the week-long campaign in September. Seven out of ten of the UK's dirtiest beaches are found in Scotland, with Kinghorn in Fife ranked top, according to a new study by Save on Energy. More than 100 low-income governments are demanding clear action from wealthier countries ahead of the COP26 conference in November. The group want rich nations to move faster to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and provide $100 billion a year in climate finance. They say they're frustrated with the slow progress at the recent G7 leader summit and meetings of G20 groups. The International Energy Agency is warning that renewables aren't expanding quickly enough to keep up with the global demand for electricity. The agency's latest report suggests global electricity will rise by 5% this year as economies recover from the pandemic. It estimates nearly half of the increase will have to be met by burning fossil fuels, which could push carbon dioxide emissions to record highs. And Exmoor's first baby beaver to be born for centuries has been named after the footballer Marcus Rashford. The National Trust asked the public to help choose a name for the young beaver after a clip of him went viral on social media. Rashford was filmed at the charity's Holnicott Estate in Somerset, where the animals were reintroduced last year. And a reminder that the weekly climate show is out tomorrow and in this episode the story of the 69-year-old grandpa turning Indonesia's mountains green. And you can watch that on Sky News social channels, our app and our website. Now, less meat, more fruit and vegetables and even algae will be needed on the menu if the UK is to meet its climate targets. Those are recommendations from the new National Food Strategy published today. It says that farmers should be helped to manage land to store carbon and millions of pounds invested in the development of alternative proteins such as lab-grown meat. Well, in a moment, I'll be speaking to the founder of a company making a slaughter-free sausage but first, here's why meatless meat could be better for the planet. Well, joining me now is Russ Tucker, co-founder of Ivy Farm Technologies, a UK lab-grown meat company. Uh, welcome to you. So tell us more about your work. What is cultured meat and a slaughter-free sausage? Hi, Anna. So cultured meat is exactly the same as real meat. It's just made in a different way. We start by taking a small sample of cells from a living animal, such as a pig or a cow. There's no slaughter required at all. We put them in the right environment, which is a tank. We call it a bioreactor. It's got the right nutrients for the cells to multiply, for them to grow. And two to three weeks later, we harvest our mints from that reactor and we can make delicious sausages, delicious beef burgers for people to enjoy. And explain to us why you say this is better for the planet. Well, it's not just me, but there's an independent study completed recently that said that if you use renewable energy to make cultured meat, uh, whatever meat that is, whether it's beef or whether it's pork, then you can save on carbon emissions, but also on land use. So right now, if you were to tuck into a delicious half pound burger, it's the equivalent of driving from London to Birmingham, 23 kilos of CO2. But with cultured meats, it would just be one kilo. So you wouldn't even get outside of London. And is it true that actually a shift towards a purely plant-based diet, diet is actually what's best for the planet? I think the reality is that people love meat. I mean, from the report today, Henry Dimbleby's report, we've seen that he considered a meat tax but chose not to do it because of 
Britain, Britain's love for the great British banger. So we have to provide a solution to consumers to give them the meat that they really love uh, at a lower carbon emissions, better land use, and I think cultured meat is one of the answers. So when could we get slaughter-free sausages on our plates? Well, our plan is to open an urban farm in 2023. So we want consumers to come to uh, the site in London where they can meet some of the animals that the cells have been taken from and to take, have a delicious sausage or delicious burger. But by 2025, we want to be making 12,000 tonnes a year, and that would save 173,000 pigs from slaughter. Russ Tucker, thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Now, the fashion and clothing industry has a huge impact on the environment, but one designer is trying to do her bit to change that. Meet Alice Potts, who makes biodegradable materials out of everything from sweat to petals. I use not only design, but biology to create new materials which actually are fully sustainable and biodegradable. My first um, material that I focused on developing was sweat crystallisation. This was a method that I worked alongside with Imperial College of collecting people's sweat and extracting out basically the sodiums, the lactic acids and um, the oestrogen to make these bio crystals which are then embellished onto these fashion materials. I also developed bio-based plastic. Unlike most bioplastics which are available in the market, it's made 100% from natural ingredients. So mine is a base of different things like seaweed, flowers and natural earth. I first went into making biodegradable face shields because one of the issues that I'd always had with my bio-based plastics was they didn't have the longevity of plastics. Because of COVID, there was a mass increase of single-use plastics being discarded. So for me, it seemed like a great opportunity to have a material which didn't have a longevity of plastics but could degrade back into the earth. The more that we start understanding about natural materialization, understanding about the earth, it's for me the best way that we're actually going to start becoming more sustainable. Well, that's everything from us for today. Next time, the underrated climate superheroes find out how sharks can help restore damaged ecosystems. That's tomorrow here on The Daily Climate Show. See you then.